Hello and welcome to this topic on pediatric anatomy, physiology and anesthesia implications. My name is Dr. Janvi and I have done my MD from Tata Memorial Hospital along with a fellowship in neuro and regional anesthesiology. Now let me tell you in all the types of anesthesia that I have seen or given, the most difficult that I find is pediatrics. Why? Pediatrics, everyone says children are nothing but just small adults, they are just mini adults and you just have to treat them in the same way. The only thing that is different in them is calculating the drug dosage and giving them accordingly. But I believe it is not so. Everything in pediatrics from the airway to the breathing to the circulation, everything is different. You need to address each and every system differently and for that you need to know the rationale behind it. Also, children don't give you that much amount of time as compared to adults in taking care of the situation. For example, if adults become hypoxic, there is at least some amount of oxygen reserve that is present in their lungs and they will give you some time before they desaturate completely. But in children, you don't have that kind of time. They can become hypoxic and then bradycardic within a matter of seconds and that can progress to cardiac arrest. So the most important thing in pediatrics is to remember that you have to be extremely vigilant and you have to anticipate if a problem is going to happen. So for that, let's have a look at how are all the systems in pediatrics placed, how are they different from adults and what are the things that we need to remember. So first question is how are children different from adults? So drug dosing fluid requirements, airway, respiratory system, circulatory system, GI system as well as pain management. All of these are different in pediatrics as compared to adult patients. Now we'll focus on each and every system. The first and foremost thing is airway in pediatrics. Now in most of the pediatric cases, it might seem easy to mask ventilate the child unless he has some congenital deformity or some trauma of this area of the head, face, neck. But what we don't realize is even in a normal child, there are some subtle changes which will make it difficult to intubate the child. So let's have a look at these subtle changes. The first thing is they have a large occiput. Occiput is this part, the part on which our head will rest. Okay. Now because of this large occiput, the head does not remain stable. So ideally when you are giving the sniffing the morning air position, your head remains stable in adults. But in children, this head keeps wobbling like this. So you are trying to intubate but the head will keep moving like that. Okay, so that will make the intubation difficult. So what we have to do is we have to place an appropriately sized gel ring or it is also called as a head ring below the patient's head. Sometimes what people do is that they place two folded bed sheets right below the patient's head, give the head a good sniffing the morning air position and that those bed sheets will help in keeping the head stable in one position. So make sure that the head is stable, the occiput is resting down on the table. Second thing is narrow nares. Nares, we are talking about the anterior nasal nares of the patient. Now because they have these narrow nares and also the fact that they are obligatory nose breathers, they cannot breathe through their mouth. Now imagine I hold your nose like this and I ask you to breathe through your mouth. You are an adult so you will be able to easily take in breath like that. But in children, they cannot follow commands or understand commands easily. So when I close the nose in them, they are not able to mouth breathe. So as a result of this, they can become hypoxic. Now because the nares over here are so narrow and children often get URTIs, they, these nares can get completely blocked by secretions. So you have to be very careful that the nasal passages are completely free. They have a large tongue. Now when I say large tongue, I don't mean that they actually have a large tongue. What they have is a large tongue as compared to the size of the oral cavity. Now in adults, the tongue is, it may be large but in the oral cavity size may also be bigger. So proportionately the tongue is okay for the oral cavity. But in children, the oral cavity is small and the tongue is very large. Now this large tongue, it becomes difficult to push it to one side and as a result of this we find it difficult to intubate in these patients. What about higher larynx? Okay, In children 
the larynx is situated at C2, C3 level and in adults it is situated at C3, C4 level. So intubating, while intubating you have to remember that you need a shorter size blade in the laryngoscope because the larynx is right here. Narrow subglottis, so we will discuss this more in detail in the following slides. Thin underdeveloped mandible, so as a result of this sometimes you may have receding mandible or a small mandible which may make intubation difficult. And the most important thing of all is that the epiglottis is omega shaped. So when the epiglottis is omega shaped, what do you get? At that time, it is a floppy epiglottis, okay? Now in a normal patient, you have an epiglottis like this and the vocal cords are uh, just be below the epiglottis, okay? So when I put my laryngoscope in the vallecula and I lift the epiglottis, it lifts like this easily, okay? L just like this. But in children, what happens is, this epiglottis, first of all, it is big and second of all, it is floppy. So I try to lift it, but it flops down. Try to lift it, but it flops down. So I'm not able to see my vocal cords as I have a floppy epiglottis. So that makes intubation difficult in pediatric patients. Now, all of these are changes in normal pediatric patients. I'm not talking about any abnormalities. I'm talking about normal pediatric patients. So can you see how they are very different from adults? And that's what you need to remember. Now, respiratory system in pediatrics. So what are the changes in airway in respiratory system in pediatrics? First and foremost, I told you that they are obligatory nose breathers, correct? So you have to make sure that the nose is not blocked by any secretions. So you have to keep those passage empty. Also, when you are intubating the patient, make sure that if you are doing a nasal intubation, you don't end up causing any trauma or bleeding because if the nasal cavities get blocked by the debris of the trauma or by the blood, then that will lead to complete closure and the child will find it difficult to breathe. Next thing is airway changes. Now in the airway, what are we talking about? I am mainly talking about this one part right below the vocal cords. And the area of the vocal cords is called as glottis. The area below the vocal cords is called as subglottis. Now if you look at the airway, you will see that the larynx is funnel shaped in children. Okay. So when the larynx is funnel shaped in children, what happens over here is this part is supposedly the narrowest part in the entire airway, the subglottic part. Now when I am intubating the child, the tube is in, correct? In children, since this part is narrow, when I inflate the cuff, due to excessive cuff pressure, there is pressure on the surrounding subglottic area. And if there is pressure on this surrounding subglottic area for a long period of time, for example, if you keep the child intubated for a long time, then this leads to subglottic stenosis. Okay? So that is why in children, they suggest that we should be using uncuffed tubes. Alright, that is the first thing that we need to remember. The second thing that we need to remember is that this epithelial lining that is there on the larynx, okay, there is a small epithelial lining. This epithelial lining is very, very loose tissue. So because it is loose, whenever you intubate, if you cause trauma to that loose tissue, you can get easy airway edema. Okay. So when you get airway edema over there, what happens? Usually in adult patients, that airway edema will cause little problems in exchange of air. However, in children, if this is the diameter of the area of the airway and the airway edema is such that it will take up 60% of the space of the entire cavity of the airway. So you will hardly have any time or any space to put the tube inside, okay? So even a little bit of trauma in children can cause a airway edema and it can lead to difficulty in breathing later. Next is respiratory reserve. So respiratory reserve in children, you can see the lung size is very small. So as a result of this, since the lung size is small, they do not store much oxygen in it. If they don't store oxygen in it, they don't have enough respiratory reserve. So if they don't have respiratory reserve, then it, they find it difficult to make up for those periods of hypoxia. 
all right